For many of us, it is the most important commitment to take care of our loved ones. We need, we feed as the Beatles song goes, and we work hard to ensure that those close to us are thriving. Today, there are 53 million people taking care of their parents, neighbors, and friends. And there are 53 million stories. From the Stanford Center on Longevity, this is When I'm 64, the podcast for caregivers. I'm your host, Ken Stern. Today, we take a close look at those who care for our wounded warriors and help them manage the challenges they face when they return home. Hey, what have you been up to? (laughs) We actually spoke Tuesday. Was it Tuesday? Yep. Okay. Oh my gosh. It's already been a long week, hasn't it? Uh, I know, but you've got so much going on. (laughs) That conversation might sound like something you'd hear between two good friends, but what we're listening to is an impromptu counseling session provided by an organization called Operation Family Caregiver, or OFC for short. It was started by the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers to support those who take care of our veterans and active duty military. Finding a group of caregivers like Operation Family Caregiver, if it's helped me be able to speak about what I'm going through in a non-judgmental area. That's Shauna Morin. She's a caregiver times six. She takes care of her husband who suffers from PTSD, traumatic brain injury, and a host of injuries from burn pits, a method the military used for waste disposal that has been linked to a multitude of health problems. She also takes care of their five children, runs a business from her home, and to top it all off, she just enlisted in the Space Force, reporting for basic training in early February. Shauna, joined here by her OFC caregiver coach, Dee Blazik, explains how she realized she needed help. My husband and I, we were in a really hard spot. I was in a really hard spot. I couldn't figure out how to find time to take care of myself. I was running this business because I worked 40 hours from home. I was homeschooling because COVID hit. I was trying to help my husband with his caretaking needs. I had so much going on on my own plate that I put myself way on the back burner. And I was like, you know what, this isn't okay. So I reached out to Operation Family Caregiver and um, Dee was placed with me. And we've been working together for about nine months now, I think, right? It's been pretty close to something about like that. Yeah, you lose, you lose track after a while. <laughs> Dee understands. We talk outside of our sessions. I still, I, I, I text her all the time. Um, and... It makes you feel like you're not isolated, that you're not alone, that there is hope out there, that there are other people on this crazy chaotic journey who haven't given up on their spouse or their child. And we we tend to band together and we try to fight for more rights for our veterans. We try to find different therapies that work like, hey, what is your husband doing? This is what we've been doing. Has it been working? So being able to bounce research off each other, I mean, I've researched so much. It's its crazy. <laughs> I love it, but it's crazy. We asked Shauna to describe her husband's injuries. Two weeks prior to them being deployed out to Iraq, they weren't supposed to be deployed for a while. He actually got into a motor vehicle accident on base and injured his back really badly. Well, then fast forward, he was <laughs> sent off to Iraq where he had to wear all the fun 50 pounds and up rucksack. Um, They were doing PT every day around the burn pits, which the burn pits are the agent orange of our generation. And that has caused a lot of debilitating problems from his guts um, to his heart and lungs, which actually in 2018 caused him to lose his job as a commercial diver because he, they thought he went into cardiac arrest. His heartbeat was 181 over 20, and the ER could not figure out what was wrong with him. So with that, and then his back injury and the constant cortisone shots, we have a lot of short-term memory issues. I have to repeat a lot. I have to schedule appointments. I have to remind him almost daily. There was a point where I had to drive because Driving would just trigger him. Um, Seeing things on the side of the road, he would think they were IEDs. Um, It's it's been a very interesting journey of learning. Dee is also married to a veteran. 
In 2015, she realized that her life as a caregiver to her husband was spinning out of control. So she reached out to Operation Family Caregiver for help. I'm a list maker. I like knowing what I'm doing and when I'm doing it. I like having some sense of control of the chaos around me. And it got to where there was no list I could make that would help me fit in time for me or time for anything else. So I actually got hooked up with Operation Family Caregiver and used to coach myself in 2015 and 2016. So that's how I kind of came into that. And now with my husband completely out of the military, luckily we've already had the VA um, confirm his PTSD and his TBI and all the other fun body aches and pains, the burn pit damage to his lungs. So that we don't have to fight, thank goodness. But the biggest challenges while he was still in was getting someone to listen to me because a lot of that happened before the protocols for TBI were made. So if he wasn't unconscious for an hour, he wasn't going to be medevaced. You just woke him up, you move on about your day like nothing happened. If it's not bleeding, there's no visible bones sticking out, you go back to duty. That's what you do. So as we got further along in his career, trying to find people to get these diagnoses, because as his wife, I'm seeing the forgetfulness, the irritability, um, his lack of ability to breathe at night. He has severe sleep apnea. And they told him, oh, that's no problem. It's like, no, when you quit breathing, that's a big problem. That's pretty life-sustaining there. <laughs> but it, it was just trying to get the supports and trying to get the help and finding resources that would work. But I think social support for me was the biggest. On top of finding all of his stuff, there was nothing for me. Being a military caregiver, you go through things that the majority of the population, no matter how old they live to be or what their experiences are, they will never have these injuries, ever. And some of the injuries are typically things you would see that are age-related, such as TBI can, can cause early onset dementia, um, cognition problems, balance. I mean, there's a whole list of things that it can cause. But if you look at, you know, my 40-year-old husband, he looks fine. And he is, but he has a TBI. There are times where his brain does not function as fast as he would like or as fast as necessary for the situation. And, you know, other people are like, well, why can't he do that? Why, why is he acting that way? Because he's frustrated. He can't focus on what's going on right now, he has a brain injury. Well, he looks fine. Yes, he does. And I love him very much, but his brain doesn't look as good as he does on the outside. So it, it gets hard sometimes and you get tired of explaining it, but then you find your tribe of people and I think military spouses and caregivers all kind of tend to clump together. Whether we mean to or not, it just happens and we understand each other. So if I tell Shauna that, oh, God, Joe locked his keys in the car again, she's not going to do anything but laugh with me because, yeah, maybe her husband has done that 80 times as well. And yeah, it's frustrating. But and if I tell, you know, my neighbor that she's going to be like, well, why don't you make him do something? Well, I, I have a key tray. It never moves. His brain didn't remember that. <laughs> so. It just, it's, it's hard to try to explain those issues to other people and get them to understand. But with the military population, I think we all kind of understand each other a little bit better. And regardless of whether you've served or not, you at least know what goes on in the military and how the injuries happen and the things that can trigger them. Whereas again, your neighbors don't necessarily know that. That's OFC coach D. Blazik talking to Shauna Morin about their lives as military caregivers. As they wrap up their conversation, Shauna shares with Dee some of her anxiety as she gets ready to leave for basic training. I'm getting nervous. The kids are starting to finally understand that I'm going to be gone for a little bit of time. And Addison this morning, when I was getting ready for my meeting earlier today, she came in and she almost started crying. She was starting to get a little sad and break down. Of course, you know, as a mom, like I, my heart broke and I was like, all right, I'm going to cry right now, but it's, it's going to be an adjustment period. And I told Justin, I was like, Hey, don't worry. And he was like, if you need anything, just get a hold of her and she can help. She's only going to be two hours away from me. It will be really, really fantastic. And 
hopefully an okay smooth transition. It will be once the kids get the hang of it, uh, you know, of you being gone for a little while, they'll, they'll get into a routine and they'll wait for your phone calls very impatiently <laughs> and then wait for graduation or leave time. And it's only a short time in the grand scheme of things. Exactly. That's why I keep saying, I was like, dad's been gone for longer. <laughs> I feel that so much. And you definitely didn't take this decision lightly. I think just from the short time I've known you, that I think finding your purpose and something to fulfill you is really going to help you because whether you like the military or not, stay in for the rest of your career, 20 years, or get out after one tour, you're going to at least know you could do it, you did it, and now I can move on to something else. Shauna's amazing. I mean, if y'all can't tell, she's amazing. <laughs> Shauna Morin and our caregiving coach, Dee Blazik, both participate in the Operation Family Caregiver Program from the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers. Now let's hear from a panel of experts who can help us sort out some of the challenges and possible solutions for military caregivers. Conwell Smith is the director of Operation Family Caregiver at the Rosalind Carter Institute, and Rajiv Ramchan is a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation and a psychiatric epidemiologist. He studies the prevalence, prevention, and treatment of mental health and substance use disorders in adolescents, service members and veterans, and minority populations. Rajiv, let's start with you. Can you describe for us the different kinds of military caregivers? We really categorize three groups of caregivers. So there's civilian caregivers. And generally speaking in society, what that refers to are people taking care of their elderly parents or their parents who are aging and dealing with conditions associated with aging, whether that's cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, things of that nature. Um, and we call them civilian caregivers. Uh, usually those are daughters of um, their ailing parents. Some sons do it too, but generally speaking, it's, it's daughters who assume that role. Then there's the pre-9-11 caregivers. So, this, actually, this group actually looks very similar to civilian caregivers. It tends to be daughters who are taking care of their aging parents, and their parents are veterans. You know, they served in Vietnam, maybe Korea, maybe the Gulf Wars, the first ones. Then we have this new cadre that looks very different of caregivers, and they're our post-9-11 caregivers. So these are people who are taking care of veterans and military service members who served in the post-9-11 era. So they're different in... I would say like the two to me most dramatic differences is who they are. So oftentimes it's a spouse caring for their spouse. It can be a parent caring for their child, or it could be a friend caring for their buddy. So that's one way that they're very different. The second way in which they're different is that their caregiving duties are totally different because they're not caring for somebody with cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia. They're caring for oftentimes somebody with, as Conwell was saying, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, a lot of mental health conditions. And those symptoms are just very different. Um, they're living with the person all the time. They're trying to navigate, you know, parenthood, you know, if they have kids with them and, and really you know, for for post traumatic stress disorder, for example, which affects around we found in, in other re work around fifteen to twenty percent of those who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, wow. Like that's, that's was a our huge number, right? I mean, it's pretty large. So, but yeah. what you're doing is you're trying to, you know, be two steps of ahead. You're trying to control situations, avoid things that might trigger symptoms. If symptoms happen you know the strategies to help the person, you know, those symptoms to mitigate them. PTSD is a very, you know, it's a, it can be chronic, but it can, it's manageable. It's a manageable condition. So the caregiver is involved in helping that, that person they're caring for manage those symptoms effectively. So that's how I think, you know, when, when we're thinking about the, them, that's what I think. There's five, just so you know, there's 5.5 million caregivers, and of that group, around 20%, 1.1 million. And this was based on a study we did in 2014, so it may have changed a little bit, but 1.1 million military or veteran caregivers, post 9-11 veteran caregivers. 
So, so uh, Conwell, Rajiv just gave us a very good sort of global look at that population of military caregivers and some specific challenges they face. Um, some of what you might describe as the in, uh, as, as struggling with the invisible wounds of war. Um, tell us, Conwell, so, sort of what you've seen at Operation Family Caregiver uh, about those challenges and how, uh, when the kind of support that military caregivers need because of those you know unique challenges. I would be happy to. So at Operation Family Caregiver, we've served uh, over 2,000 caregivers in 43 or 48 states and territories. And so we have a lot of experience on one-on-one -on -one coaching. And with that, we find out a lot of information about their experiences. And so I want to echo uh, what Rajiv was saying about the population. The population is very unique because it's cross-sectional. And I think when it comes to really looking at the impact on the American caregiver, this cross-sectional view is actually very, it's a very helpful lens because where we looked at caregivers in the past, or as you've talked about daughters, and I'm one of those, uh, I, I will say I actually moved back home from Washington, D.C. recently because my father has dementia. And so I, I understand that age demographic well. And I think if we were just generally talking about caregivers, more often than not, whether it's the programs or or even those discussing it, they tend to be a very, uh, a very. there's a lot of sameness in that geographic. Um, and so we, we treat caregivers out of departments of aging, for example, and, and that type of thing. So very siloed care. But with, with military caregivers, it's extremely cross-sectional. And so we're finding out that um, if you can deal with them in their abilities to handle the situation, we're finding just incredible outcomes on, you know, increases in preventive care for the caregiver alone. People don't think about a caregiver as a vulnerable population, but we at RCI, we do. We notice that when you're taking some care of somebody with a chronic illness, you're missing your own doctor's appointments. You're not getting full sleep. There's actually a unique vulnerability to being the caregiver. So at OFC, we're finding out that when we do these one-on-one -on -one programs about management, of, of the process that we're seeing increases in preventive care. We're, we're seeing um, just, a, just an incredible amount of, uh, of acceptance and improvements in the mental state. And I think that is also a, a, an amplification. I think our experience, our one-on-one -on -one experience is an amplification of Rajiv's study because we did a caregiver in crisis survey in the fall and found out that and, and this was unique to pandemic, we found out that 83% of caregivers are experiencing incredible increases in stress. Well, we know that one of the number one issues in the military caregiving space is that stress. It is mental health. It's coping mechanisms. Because think about the age of that population, the amount of juggling that they are doing with children at home, with, with a key breadwinner possibly being ill, you know, it, it is a very unique time of life, uh, especially if you're looking at the post 9-11 uh, caregiver. So uh, so I do think it's a unique lens. I think they have uh, unique challenges. And and so specializing in pro having programs that specialize in their experience is extremely important. So uh, we just heard from Shanna, one of uh, the uh, military caregivers who's actually being helped by, the, by Operation Family Caregiver. Uh, and she has sort of the... Uh, a lot of the challenges you just described, Conwell. She's um, she has five kids. Um, uh, uh, her husband has traumatic brain injury. Um, she's trying to work. She actually has her own podcast, and she's about to join the space force as a as a recruit. And I get exhausted and tired, and actually uh, I'm a little bit uh, suffering myself for just from listening to her. You know all the challenges she had. How do you help? I mean, uh, both of you. How would you help a caregiver who's faced all these sort of enormous? Um, stresses from all parts of, uh, of her life. Well, thank you uh, for that opportunity. So um, first of all, I, I want to highlight that our services are free for all. They're confidential. They're personalized. They're wherever and whenever. So we've, taught, we've learned how to do it virtually or over the phone or, or even have meetings in person when, when, that's, when we're able. And our one-on-ones are long-lasting. I mean, we're talking about a six to eight-month process of numerous meetings and follow-ups and tools. So we're really working with, uh, with a procedure that we're, uh, we're doing role modeling and a, a number of services that kind of put us in the situation. And we're trying to be, when I say personalized, we're trying to make sure that we're responding to that unique caregiver's 
needs or, or difficulties. So, um, so that's, that's kind of one way we're, we're approaching this. We do know that when somebody goes on that through that one-on-one -on -one process with our caregivers, we use a focus model, which is really, uh, it's, it's really to break down what is your greatest challenge and how can, how can we improve your coping mechanisms? And that's a big part of it. So that you're so that you're juggling all of these issues well, and we're finding incredible outcomes. We're finding out the caregivers are more satisfied with their lives, that they feel better prepared to take care of not only the patient, but to take care of their families, and they're having fewer health health complaints after going through our program. Now, I I do want to say right now, I don't know if it is a sign of the times with COVID or if it's because the VA is really is really stepping up their caregiver support program. But to give you an idea of what the demand is right now, in all of last year, we, we have seen in January almost the same numbers of referrals that we saw in all of 2020. I mean, think about that. One month, and we are, it, 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 is, uh, yeah. it is both um, an opportunity and a challenge for a small organization such as ours. And so we're, we're actually right now in a grant process with Wounded Warrior Project that I'm very excited about in that we're studying, um, we call it OCS. We, we love our military acronyms at, at, at Operation. <laughs> what does OCS stand it, for? It stands for yeah. Operation Caregiver Support. And so we're really looking into the combination of programs. So what if somebody goes through a one-on-one -on -one and a support program, which could have 30 individuals in it? Or what if somebody only goes through the support program? Are they getting the same, are we seeing the same type of outcomes? Because we have to study uh, the ways we're interacting so that we can try to positively influence as many lives as possible with the resources that we have. And so, um, so we're excited about that. It's actually when we, when we're doing the, the group sessions, we're basing that on all of the, the services and discussions that we have been doing in one-on-one, -on -one. but, uh, but we're looking forward to this process this year to find out more about, about what the, that impact might be. It sure would be nice if we could reach more people. Rajiv, I, I saw the other day that one of the first Biden administration uh, appointments in the Veterans Administration was a special assistant or a senior advisor for military caregiving. But I want to ask you, what would you, if she was calling you right now and said, what should I do? What do we do need to do more of to help military caregivers? How would you advise her? Sure. Well, I have to say that um, the appointment is Meg Cabot, and I got to know Meg when I was working um, on the with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, and so um, I have I think it's a great appointment. Meg is so maybe she's already called you. So yeah. what'd you tell her? Well, I so it's it, it's interesting. What we really so I'm gonna I'll talk about like a systems level thing. So I think that a lot of work has gone into thinking about caregivers like add-on programs for caregivers. So for example, respite um, care, um, you know, thinking about what that looks like for post 9-11 caregivers. But I would say that that's a, like kind of an add-on program. What I think that I would focus on at this point is thinking about diversity of caregiver communities. So how, and that's something that we didn't, we weren't able to really look at, at our, in our study. So what is the caregiving experience like for uh, lower income you know, individuals? What is the caregiving experience like for Black or Latinx uh, or Indigenous veterans? What is the caregiving like for, uh, you know, LBG, LGBTQ families um, and veterans? So, and, and is the VA and other services adequately supporting those subpopulations? I'd also, you know, advise her to think about like the systemic issues. So in certain ways, the VA is constrained because they can provide some services to caregivers, but they cannot provide health care to family members. They can only provide health care to the veterans. So we have to be thinking about, you know, so, so how are those community linkages happening to ensure, as Conwell said earlier, that caregivers are receiving preventive care, that they are receiving uh, mental health care, that they are taking care of their own health, because the VA can't provide that, like, legislatively, you know, they, they're, they just don't have that capacity, but how can they facilitate that and ensure that that's happening? And then, and then I also think about, you know, this is not going to come as a surprise, especially when you're caregiving for, you know, unfortunately for a guy, for a, a man that, you know, the doctor and the, and the patient 
will have one relationship. Oh, how are you sleeping? Oh, I'm sleeping fine. How is this? How is that? And the caregiver knows that it's actually very different from what's being discussed. But we have all these privacy concerns and things that we have to think about. So I would really be thinking about how can you include caregivers in the delivery of care so that they can provide insights to the provider and that the provider can help them with some of these symptoms. And just so baking caregiver support in to existing systems of care, if that makes if that makes sense, but doing so in a way that respects the patient's um, privacy and confidentiality, but just doing it in a vein that can really um, promote discussion. So I think that that's really important. Um, and and I think you know it even goes on to the points that you know let's step away from you know mental health and some of these other concerns. If you're sitting there and an appointment, a physical therapy appointment lasts you know, two to three hours, just to say, um, you know, what, what are the services that you have for family members during that time period? Are they like, what does the waiting room look like? What do the chairs look like? Can they put their feet up? You know, things like that are very small, but it's just thinking about the entire person and their nexus of support and thinking about the caregiver in all of these circumstances. So that's what I'm really interested in is how do we bake in the support for caregivers, um, throughout kind of the, the care that the person is receiving. One of the issues that came up with Shauna and Dee, her coach, was uh, the challenges that they face with broader society, especially with, with when, um, as was the case with, with Shauna, uh, her husband has traumatic brain, has an invisible wound of war. Tra- uh, um, um, people are used to thinking of caregivers as someone who is visibly old or visibly young. Um, but her husband doesn't look any different than any other able-bodied person, even though he has got uh, significant challenges. Um, how, how have you observed sort of the challenges that military caregivers face, you know, who are dealing with invisible wounds of war, face in broader society with business, with, with bosses and jobs and society as a whole who may not quite understand the challenges they're facing? I am, I'm thrilled you're mentioning this because uh, we're embarking on a, a quite a bit of study in the employer space. And, you know, we really want to get at caregiver status. You know, does the employer even know that somebody is a caregiver at home? And if they did, what policies could help support them uh, that can be absorbed in that HR and employer space? So uh, this gets into the realm of what we don't know. What we do know is that, uh, that oftentimes a caregiver is forced to change their uh, their career landscape. Again, I'm an example of this. Uh, I ended up uh, going from being in-house somewhere to hanging my own shingle just so that I could have the flexibility to be home and not have that regret of not being there for a parent. So, But what we know about if you leave the workplace, we know how difficult it is to get back into it. And so, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier about a lot of times you're talking about the injury of a primary um a primary breadwinner in the family. And so of course there's financial strain. And I think we need to do more work with partners to make sure that we are taking the pressure off those families, that we're providing them with uh, financial tools and financial literacy tools to to manage the situation. And that really, while, while we do not operate in that financial space, we do know that in, in preparedness and in walking somebody through their problems and talking through those problems that we see, you know, a value of life increase. We see depression symptoms decrease. We see preventive care increase. And so we want to be a part of all of those solutions. And we can only be that if we start answering those questions that we don't quite know the answer to just yet. And we get the engagement of insurers, employers, providers, uh, the system of healthcare. We have to get everybody to to walk in lockstep to make the situation better for families. That's Conwell Smith. She's the director of Operation Family Caregiver at the Rosalind Carter Institute, and Rajiv Ramchan, who is a senior behavioral scientist at the Rand Corporation. Be sure to check out Shauna's podcast, Behind the Service, about her life as a military spouse and caregiver. Terry Thompson is the senior producer of What I'm 64, and Ava Ahmed Beggy is our associate producer. Special thanks to the Elizabeth Dole Foundation for their help with this episode. Please like us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can find out more about us by visiting our website, longevity.stanford.edu. 
You've been listening to When I'm 64, the podcast for caregivers. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Ken Stern.